All right. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our session today for venous disease. Uh, my name is Karen Harth, and I'm here with this esteemed panel who will share a lot of their perspectives regarding lower extremity uh, venous disease. So we'll start off with uh, Dr. Carmen. All right, good morning. We're gonna try in eight minutes to talk about lower extremity edema. This could easily be about a three hour talk, but we'll go as quickly as we can. So I don't have any disclosures relative to this. So the case we're gonna talk about today is a 56 year old lady who comes to clinic for bilateral lower extremity swelling. This is a long standing problem. She says probably for a couple of years. Her primary care doc put her on diuretics that didn't seem to improve the condition. Um, her only past medical history really is that of obesity. She has a BMI of 42. She has hypertension and hyperlipidemia. She does have a history of a DVT about 20 years ago while she was pregnant. That affected her left lower extremity. So when we talk about edema, we have to understand that this is really what we um, refer to when we're talking about fluid homeostasis. And any time the capillary filtration rate, so that tissue fluid coming across the capillary membrane, is in excess of what the tissue fluid is able to drain via the lymphatics, we end up with lower extremity swelling. In order to have intact homeostasis and to keep this all neutral, there really are five components that are necessary. We have to have a normal central pump, normal osmotic and oncotic forces at the uh, capillary membrane or the capillary bed. We have to have an intact venous system without reflux or obstruction, a normal calf muscle pump, that is the pump from the foot back to the heart, and then functioning lymphatics to pick up that excess tissue fluid and move it back into circulation. So when we create our differential, there are a number of things we look at to help us determine why somebody has swelling. Distribution is very important. If we have a unilateral process, that's usually one quadrant, and so we're looking at a different process than if we have a bilateral distribution where we're thinking about something more central and or systemic, and that is our starting point. Our differential is dependent on the age of the patient, whether they're young, they're middle-aged, or they're a bit older. The onset, is it recent? Are we thinking an acute event or a subacute process versus something that's more long-standing? And then the timing, is it intermittent? Does it come and go? Is it progressive? Has it gotten worse over the last several days, weeks, months? Or, and is it persistent? So then we can create our differential. We always have to think about that central pump, RVLV failure, diastolic disease, any constrictive disease or cardiomyopathy, pulmonary hypertension from any etiology, whether it's sleep apnea, et cetera. Disrupted and osmotic oncotic forces at the endothelial membrane, including many of our medications that patients take affect the, uh, the, the osmotic and oncotic forces. We have to make sure we have normal venous function we're not dealing with issues of reflux or obstruction, whether that's intrinsic or an intravascular process or an extrinsic process, including central obesity. Impaired calf muscle pump function, we want to talk to the patient about their mobility, do they use assistive aids or devices, and then we have to know what are the lymphatics doing. And we can have primary issues with our lymphatics or secondary issues. So what else do we need to know about our patient? Well, she sleeps in a chair, and she does this because she can't breathe. When she lays down at night, she just feels like she's suffocating. She walks with a cane. She has a lot of underlying osteoarthritis, and, and her activity is very limited. She doesn't do her own shopping. She has support for her housework. Her daughter comes over and helps take care of these things, and she has a very sedentary job. So when we think about these patients and how are we going to evaluate them, we have a number of different types of imaging things that we can use. A venous insufficiency duplex can help us with obstruction or reflux. What we're looking for are, are, are our waveforms normal? Do we have a normal respirophasic flow? Or do we have evidence of reflux? Do we have an evidence of continuous flow suggesting an obstructive process? Or do we have pulsatile waveforms, which tells us that we have central pressure and or volume overload? We may need a CT abdomen and pelvis, particularly if we're looking for an obstructive process or a subacute process. Echocardiography is very important in, these, in some of these patients to help us look at our central pump, MRI or MRV imaging, and then rarely but sometimes we'll use classic lymphocentigraphy to know what our lymphatics are doing. So for her, we have a venous insufficiency scan that shows proximal pulsatile waveforms. We have some chronic changes with a little bit of deep reflux in the right as well as the left popliteal vein. 
And our echo, while our EF is normal and our V, is, our, our v function is normal, we do, do have an elevated RVSP. So how do we put this together? From a cardiac standpoint, our mild increase in RVSP and our, her inability to lay flat, we sent her for a sleep apnea valve. And that may be the etiology of our pulsatile waveforms, but we have to look a little more closely at this. From an osmotic and oncotic uh, uh, force issue, we have to pay attention to amylodipine if they're on that for their hypertension. But don't forget about NSAIDs and gabapentin. A lot of patients on these drugs. She has uh, a little bit of this pulsatile waveform. We know we have obesity and we have some degree of increased central venous pressure from that. She has a sedentary job, so we need to talk to her about walking every hour, get that calf muscle pump working. And then from a lymphatic standpoint, it's not uncommon that patients with longstanding venous insufficiency or venous hypertension end up with secondary lymphatic dysfunction, and that certainly is likely a contributor here. So she has what we call classic flebo lymphedema, all right? So she has venous disease contributing to underlying secondary lymphatic dysfunction. You can see evidence of the lymphatic dysfunction with the dorsal hump, the squared off toes, the deep creases at the base of the toes. So she has persistent fibrotic changes in the skin, secondary lymphatic damage, and by far and away, this is the number one cause of secondary lymphedema in developed countries. She does have some asymmetric, asymmetry of her disease, despite having bilateral disease, likely to, related to the history of the DVT, and that may indeed need more evaluation going forward. So what do we do? How do we resolve this? How do we help this patient? Well, we first have to discuss with her the etiology and the pathophysiology, and we have to talk to her about ulcer prevention, preventing blisters, et cetera. We give her conservative care for her skin, help soften the fibrosis. Compression becomes very important, and working with these patients to get adequate compression on board can be very difficult, but it can frequently be done. We send her for medical management of her comorbidities, including sleep apnea and obesity, we can consider medications like micro, micronized purified, purified flavonoid fraction, or MPFF. This is not a diuretic issue in most cases, unless they have evidence of, of elevated central filling pressures. We can also consider decongestion with manual lymphatic drainage or lymphedema therapy. We can consider sequential compression pumps, et cetera. And if we find additional venous disease in these patients, we can consider ablative disease or we consider other uh, interventions. So key topics or key learning points. Edema is typically multifactorial in many of our patients. We need a comprehensive approach to evaluating these patients. We have to make sure we're managing all of the other contributing comorbidities. Education and conservative management is typically very effective, but we can't overlook all of the other contributors. And we don't rely on diuretics for the majority of these patients unless we know we have cardiac disease, renal disease, et cetera, contributing. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much for that really comprehensive review of <clears throat> the patient with leg edema. Um, I'm going to open it up for some questions now. So the way this works is eight-minute presentation followed by a seven-minute for uh, question and answer. So, uh, please come forward with your questions, and I'll open it up to our panelists here for any questions. So, Terry, great uh, comprehensive uh, talk, and thank God it's not three hours. Um, and um, one of the most frustrating thing um, in the assessment of edema for me is the pulsatility. Um, that we see on um, uh, the reflux studies or venous duplexes, which reproduced, you know, when you put a catheter to a blade, you'll see the pulsations coming out. But then um, I call my partners, uh, two of them are here, Chris and Mike. They do a right heart cath. To date, uh, the right heart cath being abnormal has been zero. Um, and these people are generally not, you know, they're Ohio obese, which is weird. I mean, wow. One, two, three, four, five, all Ohio here, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and Iowa here, and that's not too far. Okay, so you all understand what I mean. So the, as the cardiologists up here, what do you guys think? Where's the pulsatility coming from? If the tricuspid is fine, if the right heart um, 
I mean, if the RV function is fine, where is the pulsatility coming from? There is no fistula, and you have to trust me on that one. I was going to let Huff answer that one. I mean, I don't know. I think people who are generally volume overloaded, you have reflected waves. You have pulsatile. I mean, you can get pulsatile, pulsatile waves reflected potentially through the aorta, um, through nearby structures. Um, you can have, obviously, tricuspid regurgitation. We, it can be transient. You know, it can come and go, depending on the loading conditions of the heart. Um, a lot of these patients with morbid obesity, of course, have elevated PA pressures, and, and those do give you, oftentimes, pulsatile uh, venous waveforms in the absence of TR. It's not just TR. And, and I'm not entirely certain I understand the mechanism, how it's shown to transmit it from the heart, but, I, but it's something we do recognize a lot. Yeah, I, I also think sometimes when they show up for the procedure, their volume status is significantly down, having been NPO. So I think it's important to tank up the right atrial pressure to what we would consider normal, maybe give them a liter of fluid, see how they respond to it, and then check their pressure. So. I think, too, um, you know, we tend to do our VI scans and our VI studies later in the day. So they are, they've, you know, had their normal diet all day long. We try to get them standing up, whereas they come to the cath lab, they're laying flat, their volume deplete, and I do think it matters. I mean, we see the same thing when we try to look at, you know, iliac vein obstruction and things like that. If we don't have them properly hydrated, I don't know that we get their day-to-day -day physiology. I think it's... <coughs> I think the most common physiology. scenario where I see it is in the obese patients with higher PA pressures. It seems to be the most prevalent. That's kind of where it's mostly observed. I have another question. Um, so this goes into the appropriateness of a venous insufficiency study. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and the group's thought as well. When you have a patient that appears to be a classic lymphedema, you know, we have to always think about our resources and using our vascular lab appropriately. Which patients, how do you select and decide um, you know, which patients should get a venous insufficiency study. Um, and then my follow-up question to that is in the patient with lymphedema, when do you initiate, let's say, referral to lymphedema therapy versus a home pump, and what's that process like? So in a patient like this, if they were symmetrical and didn't have a history of DVT, I may not get a VI scan. But because they had asymmetric swelling, and I would really like to know what's going on from a, an intravascular standpoint. I think a VI scan is warranted and or appropriate. It's gonna help me with information. If, if I'm not gonna use the information, I don't think you need a VI scan, if that makes sense. Um, so, so first, I think it, you have to, it's like anything else, what's your pretest probability and what are you gonna do with the study and the information? Um, certainly, I have a similar patient who's 80 and tells me she wouldn't want a procedure. I would never get a VI scan, and I think it would be completely appropriate. Um, what was the second question? Oh, lymphedema therapy and so, yeah, home pumps, things like that. I tend to try to manage these patients conservatively initially. If we're not getting very far, I think manual lymphatic drainage and seeing a lymphedema therapist makes sense. And then when it comes to using or ordering a home pump, et cetera, I try to take my cues from what the lymphedema therapist gives me. And if they think it would be helpful and they think a patient would be compliant with it and they think that it's going to get used, then I would order that um, and, and try to get it into their hands. Quick question. So if you have a patient with venous reflux and lymphedema, in the setting of a high BMI? How do you address that patient? Do you start with the obesity issue, try to get the BMI down? Do you go after the venous reflux first? How do you manage that? What's your sequence you know, of treatment in this patient? So Nick, if, if I put it on? No. Um, let, let me give you my thoughts. Obviously, there is nothing, no guideline. This is evidence-based vacuum. Uh, I, common sense-wise, the way I look at it is, A, am I going to do any damage to this patient's leg? And thermal ablations, I have seen where lymphedema has gotten worse because the saphenous you know, lymphatic trunk is pretty close to the saphenofemoral junction. And unless you do extreme, ex uh, unless you put extreme caution in terms of how you to mess that area and ablate it, um, 
Yeah, there's a slight chance that the lymphedema can get worse. Assuming that there is no problem with your therapy, how is the patient going to be benefited? Well, the patient will still have to do the home pump. They still have to do the MLD. They still have to do the SOC, right, or compression uh, garment. So in those patients, I don't even test for venous insufficiency unless they're failing appropriate lymphedema uh, therapy because I'm not going to change their lifestyle. If, if I can add one thing to that, if they have an ulcer, I tend to go earlier because I do think even with all the other comorbidities, managing the reflux or managing the base of the ulcer uh, helps. So it depends on what the patient presents with. Yeah, I think the ulcer patient changes the discussion completely. Um, and I think, I'm sure everybody here agrees with that. And um, I do think over a BMI of 40, I mean, the challenge is, you know, so I, at, at the vein, our vein center, we've tried to start a collaboration with our bariatric group. But it's very hard to get them in. They're oversaturated with patients. You know, they kind of have a limited resource and, and uh, ability to get them in. Um, so there's, you know, there's new things. There's the Ozempics. There's all these other things. So I think they're starting to incorporate that into their management of these patients. But I think getting, getting the non-ulcer patients into more of the medical part, the ob dealing with the obesity before you go uh, doing any kind of venous procedure is very important because you're just not going to get a good outcome. And it's going to be, um, you know, that neither the patient nor you will be satisfied at the end. Sorry, real quick. If, you're gonna, if we're going to do that, there has to be a strategy for helping the obesity. Because way too often people are like, well, you just need to lose weight. Um, multiple people present to my office and I'll have a discussion with them about appropriate nutrition, exercise for weight loss. And you know, they're 60 years old, they have multiple doctors and they say no one's ever had this discussion with me. So we really need to stop passing the buck on some of these patients and help them. All right, well thank you for that awesome dis case and discussion. We're gonna move on to our second presentation by Dr. Razavi. It's a case two of May Thurner syndrome. And Great, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna go quickly, guys, through this so, so, so we can leave some time for a discussion since I'm already one minute, 43 seconds over time. Um, so uh, here are my disclosures. Epidemiology of May, May Thurner's really iliac vein compression is common. It's a normal variant. So anything you see doesn't need to be stented. So the entire theme of my talk is gonna be don't, don't, don't because of all the issues we've had with the venous stenting and the abuses of venous stenting. Um, now, symptomatic left common iliac vein compression is not as common, about 20 to 70%, as you can see that we really don't know when the statistics are that wide uh, of patients with left lower extremity uh, DVT have uh, May Thurner. But in large prospective trials, about 60% of the patients with DVT get stents. So it is more common, so we know that. Also remember that the May Thurner or iliac vein compression can occur at multiple points. It's not just left common iliac vein. It can occur lower down, as you can see right there. And it's between the internal and external iliac arteries that they compress the vein and the other side. And you can see on the left, on the right side of the screen right there, there is a compression of the external iliac vein uh, and not the common, which is the May Thurner. Now, here's the question. Uh, which one of these need treatment? Let me ask the audience, quick, quick hands up. The one mostly on the left, does that patient need treatment? Does, do we need to stent that patient? What about on the right? No opinions? All right, well, the, it turns out that this is to emphasize the fact that first of all, the presentation is quite varied, all right? You can't really tell by venography who needs treatment, who doesn't. Even if you put the IVIS in there, and you're gonna see compression in all of those, okay? Here's one of those patients. This patient happened to have a knee surgery and after knee surgery developed edema, all right? Had no DVT, developed edema, and they insisted that oh, I must be something here, and we did the uh, venogram, and of course you can see a severe compression right there. Should we treat this patient? Should we not treat this patient? Is the compression there responsible for patient's edema, or is it the knee surgery? Should we wait? Should we not wait? do not trigger an immediate stent as soon as the patient presented. This patient has been like this all her life, 
Okay, this didn't happen right after the knee surgery. All right, indications for treatment, symptomatic. You have to be convinced that the symptoms are due to compression. And I just mentioned a couple of those. Um, stent implantation is the preferred method. Exercise caution, as I mentioned to you. Who should be stented? Symptomatic, symptomatic, symptomatic. I can't emphasize that enough. What degree of obstruction predisposes patients to uh, uh, symptoms? Really, honestly, we don't know. We all say that, you know, pressure gradient of two, three millimeter, well, that's within the error of measurement. 50% reduction in cross-sectional uh, 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 area, that has not been uh, uh, validated. And significant stenosis, really not validated. Presence or absence of collaterals may also be misleading. So really, this is an area that we don't really know. What I want to caution you is that if you look at all the uh, venous stent trials, look at that left column, non-thrombotic patients. The patency is not 100%, okay? Four or five percent of these patients lose patency at one year. That means you t if, if the symptoms are not, if the compression is not the cause of the symptoms, then you have put a stent in there, and about four to five percent of these patients may develop DVT. The other thing is, should we strive for circumferential apposition? Now let's talk about some technical stuff. So let's say we have decided that this patient needs a stent and you're gonna put a stent in there. Chronic stuff is gonna be talked about by other panelists, so I'm not gonna get into that. We're talking about simple iliac vein compression. So should we strive to have circumferential apposition to the vessel wall? Another one that really don't know. We probably should. And, but it, it will, you know, if you don't, it will like to reduce the risk of thrombosis, like to reduce the risk of migration. You may not have been sizing this correctly. Also keep in mind that gross oversizing has a price to be paid also. You, make you definitely increase the risk of stent fracture, that's for sure. Stent erosion into adjacent structures have been reported. Effect of chronic output force is really not well characterized in the veins, okay? We know that effect in the arteries, not really in the veins. And then you get this Poisson effect. So what is the Poisson effect? Look at this guy <clears throat> that I showed you to, so earlier. So after we stented this, <clears throat> this is by the way post-DVT patient. So after we cleared the DVT, there's that stenosis. So this was a stented, look at that. And so what that is, is the longitudinal foreshortening in response to radial expansion, which leads to collapse of the adjacent veins. We've all seen it. I used to think that this is a spasm and just let it go. This patient got stented because a few of these that we let go rethrombosed. And so that certainly impacts the inflow. And inflow is one of the most important things for the patency of your stents. So, this has not been well characterized. Who gets it? Who doesn't? How, what to do with it? These are the issues, unfortunately, on the venous side we don't know. And please don't do that when you're stenting, that lower one. Now, this has been correlated to uh, occurrence of DBT on the, on the contralateral side, but remember, it's usually associated with the use of closed cell braided stents, like wall stents or the other stent that has been pulled out of the market at this point. Really very uncommon in patients with uh, open cell night null uh, stents that we use nowadays. Having said that, if I were to do these, I generally do not create double barrel uh, uh, cava aorta of any kind if we don't have to. Uh, and, and the configuration that I use is the middle one if the cava is involved or the venous confluence is involved. And the reason is this, look at that. That's a cava that was recanalized and, and stented, and you can see that it's a double barrel. That, that's a good way to embolize the cava. Or one stent can compress the other. Okay, so these are the things that you need to be sort of uh, convinced about. Here's a stent, this is courtesy of, of uh, Rusty, that the, you can see here's the stent is going clear across. The stented side is out, the other side is not. So if you use the correct stance, open cell, this probably will not be a problem. And this is the situation that you don't want to get into. If you have this situation, then yeah, you got to come from the contralateral side and put a stent in there. One last point I make before I go. Be cognizant, especially in, in, in chronically occluded veins. There are collaterals of the iliac veins and of the IVC that go to places that they don't belong, all right? That no catheter belongs unless 
you're trying to get into that space. So the catheter is in, they do an injection of contrast, this is what they see. What is this, guys? What are we looking at? Anybody? This is a myelogram, guys. This is not an IVC gram. They went in an open vein. This is an open vein. This was not even chronically occluded, but the tip, look at the tip of that sheath from the left groin. It's facing those typical collaterals that go into the epidural plexus. And off they end up here. So be very careful in chronic situations, okay? This is a myelogram. Uh, I, I won't spend time on this. You guys can look it up yourself. Here's one of our patients. One of my partners did it. Chronic occlusion. Tried to get across. Typical. We've all seen it, right? This is that patient with epidural bleed. And this patient became paraplegic. So be very, very cautious. So again, my talk entirely was cautionary. Don't stand when you don't need it. Make sure you confirm that the symptoms are due to compression, and then a few technical points, and please avoid this situation. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Great uh, cases and um, cautionary tips. I'll open it up for questions uh, from our panelists and the audience. So, so you talked about sizing, you know, what, first of all, IVIS, of course, is, is becoming the standard for sizing to the most part, and uh, so what, what do you do for sizing, and does that change with the type of stents that you use, you know, Abri versus Venovo versus Vivid? It changes with the type of a stent, whether you're using wall stent versus night null stents, closed cell versus non-closed, with, with those things. With the, with the two most common stents in the market right now in the U.S., no, it doesn't really matter. We usually oversize about two millimeter based on IVIS. And I had a few slides on how to size, which I took out. We don't have time. Uh, generally, uh, we, take, we take a, a you know, the, the other problem is we have uh, common iliac occlusion. What's the reference vessel? You know, uh, if you have a stenosis, this issue of pre-stenotic dilatation is a common finding. Is that the right way to do it? Or is that? Mm -hmm. so, so there are a lot of issues on the venous side that we're guessing right now. Typically, we, uh, you know, all, all the studies that have been completed took out two millimeter, you know, uh, the diameter increase and then you put it in. So generally, the rule of thumb, 14s and 16s in the common iliac, and then just uh, slowly come, you know, lower uh, 12s and 14s, and then the other thing is you definitely, guys, do not want to undersize in the common femoral or external iliacs, especially if they develop DVT down the road, then we're stuck. Uh, so so it, it's, it's, it's just as important to size them properly as there are in the SFA or below the knee. So, so if you have a pre dilatation, do you try to extend the stent all the way to the external iliac so you can capture it better for, to avoid stent migration? So pre dilatation? Uh, no, I don't. Now, I know that's not the practice and the recommendations of various societies is to extend them to the external iliac. The reason I don't do that is because you don't have proper tapered stents at this point, okay? Now, those are coming but we don't have them at this point. If I have a, just a simple Maytherner of an iliac, a common iliac vein compression, the two things you don't want to do, you don't want to end your stent at the point of con, uh, conflection of the, uh, of the uh, uh, external iliac to common iliac. On the other hand, you also don't want to extend all the way down to the common femoral. There really is no need for that. So now, uh, it, that, that's where the art comes in, uh, is that now if you look at our I practice common iliac, six centimeter, eight centimeter stents are used, are used more common than 12 or 10 that go all the way down. Um, and we haven't had any issues, but I, I tell you that if you are, you know, we've done over a thousand, you know, deep venous interventions, so our system, everybody's, you know, pretty good at it. But if you are not that familiar, I exercise caution, do extend it into the external iliac. Yeah. I don't want to take all the questions, but one final question. <laughs> the anticoagulation, you know, in a non-thrombotic, uh, you know, uh, we know if, if it's a previous DVT, you have to do it. 
do oral anticoagulation afterwards. But how about if it's non-thrombotic? What are you doing? Antiplatelets? Yeah, uh, anticoagulants? Right. Non-thrombotic, all the studies uh, encouraged but did not uh, require antiplatelets. Uh, so we would put them on antiplatelets if it's non-thrombotic. Uh, if it's thrombotic, they need to obviously be anticoagulated the same way you would anticoagulate any, anybody else. It also depends on, on, uh, on the size and the flow that we get afterwards, but generally it, it does not appear that we need to anticoagulate non-thrombotics. Um, so, question is related to um, what, what positional maneuvers do you use, or how do you identify, especially for the non-thrombotic patients, because I think those are certainly the most challenging. Um, so once you've decided you're trying to investigate this lesion for the symptoms of the unilateral symptoms, do you do things both pre-procedurally and intra-procedurally to help you um, decide if it's a true uh, compressive or static fixed lesion? Uh, to rule that out, How, what's your approach and what do you recommend? So, so the, the question, if I understand it correctly, is if you see a compression in a recumbent patient, do you put them through maneuvers to see what, yeah. Usually what you want to do is, is what we do is you put, if you're not really sure, and it, I tell you that's the case in most of these patients unless they've had a DVT, is that we put the IVIS in there, we, we put them in Valsalva maneuver or have them cough. Okay, see what kind of dilation you get. Some of our European colleagues, what they do, they do what is called a balloon test. They put a 12 or 14 millimeter balloon, inflate it, and see if it could easily pass through the stenosis. If it can, then that's probably not a real lesion, and that the sneaky and things that are developed in Mayther is probably not there. It's a very hard decision. Now, our tables go, uh, our tilt table. So we actually sit patient, we can go to about 45, 50 degrees, safe, we also, they can stand on it. We repeat the venogram, it's also very good for refluxions in the internal iliac pain in patients that may have uh, pelvic venous disorders. Um, and and uh, we repeat the thing. And it's amazing that with a little Valsalva and a little bit of cough, you see how much dilatation do you get of the, those are the ones that we really, we really think twice about the stenting. I think the other role too, just to add to that, um, pre-procedurally in the vascular lab, you can certainly do that. So we'll have the patient turn into their right lateral decubitus. You can do similar. I think the, the breathing and the coughing is hard because it's hard for them to scan during that point. But you will often see it, I mean, like, for me, it, you gotta, it has to be fixed. And you'll see it just kind of dilate up really beautifully, um, and you can kind of tell that right away. So that's you have to have good, of, good ultrasound text yes, to for do sure. that. Yeah. 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 So I'll ask a question that comes up a lot in this topic, and it's, it's kind of ripe for somewhat controversy. Do you think an acute DVT on the ipsilateral leg is considered a symptom and therefore necessitates stenting? Do you stent all of your true May Thurners that result in or, or are associated with DVT? That's a great question. I tell you that uh, five years ago, we decided that for a period of uh, a year, that we won't stent everybody, we bring them back, okay? It turned out the, the only difference we saw was that the, the stented length got shortened because a lot of them who had external iliac you know, residual clot all cleared up and they went back to their baseline. This is in compliant patients. If there's any concern that the patient may not be compliant or the flow just looks awful, we stent them at the time, but we, we don't hesitate to, to wait and, and anticoagulate the patient and bring him back. Then at that point, if you see a lesion, is that real or not? I mean, that, that, that's, I don't know if we have an answer to that question. Mahmoud. When you bring him back, say for venography for all of them, or just the? Uh, ultrasound, okay. ultrasound. Now, at, at our place, we do CT venograms and MR venograms. Uh, which the, the, the radiologists are good enough to do that uh, because we have forced them to be good enough. Um, the, uh, but ultrasound, if you have good ultrasound techs, in, in ultrasound, ultrasound techs, some of them are not, you know, so. Mahmoud, I, I want to put a plug in for the paper that will probably come out in the next couple of weeks. It's a consensus statement for management of uh, Neville's um, in collaboration with uh, American Venus Forum, American Vein and Lymphatic Society, and Viva. Um, Sahar Sabri and uh, um, 
and Kush this I let it. So it's been accepted in CERC intervention, so it should be out in a couple of weeks. So some of these questions, there will be consensus statement on that. So these are all recommendations. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah. That's it. The, the, yeah. Okay, so excellent. Another, wait, do you want this one? I'll, I'll. <laughs> Here, and this one. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, Dr. Kalori now who will be speaking to us on endovenous ablation. All right, these are my disclosures. Um, we all know how, how chronic venous insufficiency presents and uh, what a great saphenous vein distribution looks like, uh, what a small saphenous vein distribution looks like, anterior and posterior accessory. If not, they're right there. Um, they can present with um, edema, they can present with skin changes ranging from lipidermatosclerosis to venous eczema, and then finally, VLU. Um, a little clue about non saphenous veins, pelvic uh, uh, veins, a pelvic source, or they're coming from either front of the thigh, middle of the thigh, or generally um, in the posterior thigh or buttocks. Um, if you don't, um, you should know the revised CEAP classification um, with the subcategories, which I won't go through, but uh, today we'll talk about um, mostly the symptomatic ones, the edema, which is C3, to venous ulcerations, which is C6, which seems to be a majority of my practice. Um, so. I want you to concentrate on that venous hypertension, and this ties very well into what Terry uh, talked about. Uh, it is the venous hypertension. Um, you will see those varicose veins in patients who have had IVC occlusion. You will see that uh, varicose veins by itself um, with reflux. Um, you will see varicose veins on the left side if there is a significant obstruction or occlusion on the left side with Mayferner syndrome or other types of uh, uh, iliac vein compression. Ultimately, it is that congested leg that leads to that chronic venous insufficiency symptoms, the hasty symptoms, which is the heaviness, achiness, swelling, throbbing, and aching. Um, so when is appropriate to perform endovenous ablation? Well. Um, in patients from C through to 6, which is varicose veins to ulceration, and if the patient is symptomatic with those and has uh, reflux, axial reflux in the great saphenous vein, with or without saphenofemoral junctional reflux, it is appropriate. And for those who, with, who don't have the saphenofemoral junctional reflux, but below the knee also in the advanced stages, it's considered appropriate according to the SVS-AVF guidelines. Um, there are two more um, recent vascular uh, uh, varicose vein guidelines. Um, we did it in two different uh, sets. Um, for those who are practicing um, any venous uh, procedures, it's probably important to have these uh, papers uh, in their pocket um, or in their drop box or whatever. I give these to my uh, residents. Um, so. How do, what endovenous therapy should we do on these patients? I'm not gonna say which one is best. Now we have lots of options. The first radiofrequency ablation was approved by the FDA in 1998. It's a 26-year-old procedure now. It's, there are a whole bunch of other things. You can cauterize them shut, you can chemically seal them shut, you can beat the van up from inside, you know, or, or go old school. And there are a whole bunch of papers on varicose veins um, and the treatments and the comparisons. Pretty much all of them do a good job. All of them, um, if done properly, have very low um, um, uh, adverse events and patients tolerate these procedures well in good hands. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, do a little vein map. Uh, this is the IVC. These are the LEX. This is the deep system. Great saphenous vein, small saphenous vein, right side, left side. So let's have that uh, kind of sealed in. This is how we do for all of my patients with venous reflux. We create a vein map. So here is somebody who has um, great saphenous vein reflux on the right side and small saphenous vein reflux on the left side, nothing, no other tributary, maybe they have edema, they want their veins taken care of. 
Well, you could do anything for this, right? I mean, as long as you have a tool to seal that vein, you could do a thermal glue, cyanoacrylate, mocha, um, or varathena, whatever, or simply say compression treatment, no, nothing else. So if the, so the goal for treating straight veins uh, is divided, Steve Elias uh, mentioned this the first time, the TT and NTNT, which is thermal tumescent and non-thermal non-tumescent, radiofrequency or laser, simple, as you can see, this is where you may start your practice. Just one axis, you take care of the vein, and it's very rare for me to see this anymore. Um, you could do the same with uh, cyanoacrylate, mechanical, mechanical chemical ablation, um, or varathena, the microfilm. Uh, for those that are not straight, such as spider veins, sclerotherapy, uh, that's easy. How about this person who has great saphenous vein reflux, a tributary that you can see on the right side, and a great saphenous reflux, although this doesn't rep represent well, the left side is massive. If I do sclerotherapy after doing the radiofrequency ablation of this, there'll be intense phlebetic reaction and their patient will not like you. So what do we do for that? That's phlebectomy where you're basically making little incisions and pulling them out. The old school technique is where you basically draw a tram track or you know, straight on the vein to mess the vein uh, and, then, um, and then pull the vein out. Uh, what we have done is we described this procedure called foam-assisted or sclerotherapy-assisted phlebectomy where we first inject foam into the vein, which results in venous spasm, and everything after that is ultrasound guided. That's tumescence, that's pulling out of the vein, and vein comes out like bloodless. Here is an example of a very long vein that come, came out almost with three cc's of um, um, estimated blood loss. And this person was actually on Xeralto for AFib. And they come back with very nice looking leg, not a lot of ecchymosis, and eventually heal up pretty quickly. All large veins go to surgery in our practice. Sometimes as you build your practice, as you mature, you'll start seeing more and more of remodeling, as I told uh, uh, Mahmoud, that uh, the first one is done and now you're stuck with something else. Here is an anterior accessory, saphenous vein, which is aneurysmal and super close. So what do we do? We we take care of the deeper one with radiofrequency ablation and then pull out, uh, <clears throat> do phlebectomy in the proximal portion where it's very close to the skin. Perforator ablations, these should be done only in advanced CVI and there's a specific set of requirements. You could use radiofrequency ablation or here's a patient where I'm ablating three different perforators with venous ulceration uh, with laser. We also do sub-ulcer sclerotherapy in patients who may not have saphenous reflux, and here is a good example where I was the fourth uh, consult, and as you can see, butterfly needles around the ulcer um, somewhere in between this 98 days, and eventually the ulcer heals. So if we move on, though, here is a patient who has saphenous vein reflux on that left side and has been sent to me for uh, treatment, uh, but folks fail to look at what the RVSP is, 70 to 75. Here is another one with leg swelling on that left side, but see the scratch marks, the asymmetry is because how much she scratched, resulting in that issue there. And if this, oops, sorry. Can we play that video, please? It just shows JVD. It's bounding. Yeah, so anyway, again, venous hypertension, we talked about the vascular issues, but then there's obesity, there's stiff ankle, there's immobility, sleep apnea, uh, cardiovascular issues, pulmonary issues. So essentially, we want to start looking at this condition and um, entity as a structural, which is the veins itself, functional, which the veins are the end result of what the problem is somewhere else. They're just bearing the brunt of it. So I will end with this. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, I'll open it up now for questions from our panelists and the audience. 
So presence of deep venous reflux along with superficial venous reflux, how do you approach that? Well, the algorithmic way to look at that um, is the, why does the patient have deep venous reflux? What is the extent of it? What is the patient's age? That's the first thing I look at. If it's a 20-year-old, 18-year-old, I saw a patient 16-year-old two weeks ago with every vein refluxing in both legs. So that's primary venous reflux. But if I see a 50, 40, 30-year-old uh, with a history of DVT, okay, that makes sense. Maybe that caused the deep venous reflux. Um, if somebody has isolated entire length of venous reflux, deep venous reflux from the groin to the knee on one side, um, I, my threshold to look upstairs is very low and have that fixed first. And then repeat the venous insufficiency study, allow six full months is how much I do, um, so that um, if need be, I mean, Mike and I share some patients where he had stented and you know, six months to a year later, they're still having symptoms, then we have laid the vein. Uh, but there are some that normalize. So uh, when there is deep and superficial reflux in the old days, um, you know, in, in early 2000s, we would never touch these patients and never do interventions on the superficial veins. Um, but now the thought process is, so long as the, the pelvic issues are taken care of, if there is residual reflux, and particularly if they have symptoms C3 through C6 especially, we go aggressively after the uh, uh, superficial system. So after you treat the deep system, assumingly there is a cause for it, do you re-evaluate the superficial yes. reflux by bringing the patient back, and how soon do you do that? Six months. Six months. Six months is okay. a minimum I give. And the other thing is most of the, if they have extensive deep vein reflux, they end up having perforator reflux too. Okay. And it's, it's sort of a nail and hammer situation that, you know, I see folks treating the perforators, but if the deep vein is flowing backwards, new perforators will go wrong. So I generally leave them alone and take care of the subulcer plexus sclerotherapy because we're not going to, it's, it's trying to, you know, paddle upstream. Um, I'll have a question. So reflux at the saphenofemoral junction, I think that um, there's always when I look at the studies, there's a couple of technical things I always take into consideration, and I wonder your thoughts on this. So with, val with or without Valsalva, reflux with or without Valsalva, um, pre-terminal valve, mm -hmm. location of that and measurements. So what's your ideal? Um, and just kind of share a little bit about that, because I think sometimes we don't, we may see reflux, but they're measuring inferior epigastric or I think yeah. where that's measured is kind of important. Yeah, uh, great question. And IAC really has some recommendations on this too, and how to measure, and the, uh, and the uh, papers that I uh, showed, the guidelines also mention that as well. The diameter has to be AP um, at the junction, and, and uh, you clearly should not take um, the junction would be before the SCV and the pudendal uh, tributaries come in. Um, that's the reflux. And in terms of Valsalva, um, in our lab, we generally don't do Valsalva unless the uh, pneumatic compression does not give the reflux and it's not making sense. So the reflux, I tell my sonographers, it has to come from somewhere and it has to go somewhere. So where is it coming from, right? So in that situation, they'll do Valsalva, but not routinely. Preterminal is, you know, as you said, beyond whatever they see. Most commonly seen tributary coming in is the superior epigastric vein. So that's, you know, just caught out to that. Yeah. Questions? All right. 
So let me ask a question to the interventionalists here. Um, go um, that way. So Mike, you see a patient um, comes in with, um, you know, uh, maybe C4 type of disease. Um, do you order a venous insufficiency? Let's just say lymphedema is out. Lymphedema is not the case. Do you do a venous insufficiency study or do you do a CTV first? Um, I probably will do a venous insufficiency study first because I, I like to, assuming I'm going to work it up, and I have, yeah. usually I will actually just yeah. try the basics first, you know, and they come back and they haven't gotten better with compression. And you've kind of gone through all the stuff that uh, Dr. Carmen talked about. Um, I like the venous insufficiency study first. Now, we used to say, you know, ultrasounds were more cost effective than CT scans. I don't think that's probably true anymore, especially right. for that exam. But it at least gives me an assessment of not just the superficial, but it gives me clues if there is significant deep vein reflux. Then it would probably push me to look, like you said, upstairs. Thank you. Yeah, I, I usually look at the unilateral, unilateral symptoms or not. If it's just uh, the left leg, for instance, is involved, you know, the right leg looks good, I'm going for a CT, you know, usually of the pelvis with venous filling. And typically, you know, of course, you're going to have to still to have the venous reflux because you need to know what's going on with the superficial and deep system downstream. Uh, but the CT becomes very important. On the other hand, if it's a bilateral symptoms, a lot of s symmetric presentation, I usually just go for the venous reflux first. So if it's unilateral, you're going for CTV first? Yeah, I, I think okay. that would raise a suspicion pretty high for something going on. Okay, what yeah. about you? Yeah, I agree with Nick. So if it's unilateral, I'm more apt to get a CT venogram up front, um, or there's something in the history that you know, screams that this could be a pelvic problem, prior intra-abdominal surgery, or symptoms of pelvic congestion, or you know, prior manipulation with catheters in the pelvis, anything like that. Um, but I would say most of the time, I do end up getting an insufficiency study first, unless something points to a pelvic problem. Yeah, I think history is key. Um, so if there's a suggestion of something more central, I think CT is good there. But I start with a venous insufficiency study. Um, again, not considering the ulcer patient or the advanced disease, but I think there's still we're still learning about um, the patient who has both deep and superficial reflux and what do you treat first and which approach should be done first for the patient. So um, in a patient who's na naive to any prior superficial disease and maybe has a focal, even if I find like a small, you know, again, I think we're still trying to understand what lesion leads to what hemodynamic effect, right? You could be very compensated and that lesion may really not be uh, contributing much, then, you know, which one do you go for first? So I think for me, the venous insufficiency first. Thank you. All right. Next uh, is Karen Hearth, uh, mechanical therapy for acute DVT. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'll be talking about a case of mechanical DV, uh, thrombectomy for DVT. Let's see if I could do this right. All right, these are my disclosures. So we have a case here of a gentleman who's, um, and it's an instant acute DVT. So 58-year-old gentleman whose BMI is 41. He has a history of remote superficial venous procedures and, and um, presents with one leg one week of left leg pain and swelling to an outside institution. Uh, prior to this, six weeks uh, prior to this presentation, he had undergone deep venous stenting. Now, I think with this, um, we're talking about appropriateness and we're talking about the right therapy for the right patient. So I think this case has a lot of lessons to be learned and, and some of these come from before I met him. So six weeks uh, prior to this, he had undergone bilateral iliac vein stenting. Both stents were 20 millimeters in diameter for what was described as a nibble presentation. Um, so no prior history of DVT. And he also had a left femoral, mid-femoral vein stenting. Again, clear what that indication was about. So he was diagnosed with acute DVT based on duplex and clinical exam. He had significant pain, edema. He already had some blistering, uh, as you can see here, uh, from his uh, chronic uh, venous stasis changes and some uh, flebo lymphedema, and he had already started weeping uh, from that leg. By the time he saw me, he was probably about 10 days into this event. He had failed outside in, uh, procedures, and he was transferred over for a second opinion. 
So pay close attention to the CT scan here. We'll try to capture it. But if you look at that left stent, it's crushed and uh, right at that flexion point in the pelvis that we've been talking about earlier. You can see it also on the sagittal, which uh, passed us by here, but it'll come back again. This is just his duplex. And so here, when we're talking about technique, this case really highlights, you know, that's one of the issues here is that technique of placement and landing of that stent. So the challenge here is several. I think you can look at this from many different scenarios, but for me, you know, this patient had a BMI of 41. He had failed previous interventions. He had significant skin changes and leg pain. Anatomically, uh, he had already come with a failed procedure, so not shown in the image, but he had significant uh, left groin hematoma, which was one of the access points, which, uh, you know, in someone with extensive DVT is not the right choice. He had a popliteal hematoma from multiple sticks and extensive DVT, and he had really thrombosed everything. He had thrombosed the inflow and the outflow, so profunda, femoral, up to the um, confluence. Technique, um, the, you know, you, you, this obviously is not great stent location and landing. The size of the stents, a 20 millimeter stent, you have to wonder why it was even needed in the first place. Um, you know, how to fix this, how to address this, what do you revise it with now that he has a 20 millimeter. And then we have the same kind of similar problem going on on the other side with, in terms of the stent landing in the wrong location. So for me, this, if I get through and we get good clearance, there's a need for medical management afterwards. We have to have commitment, we have to have compliance. So I have a long discussion with the patient. My protocol is to put them on Lovenox. We've got to be aggressive with the leg to get the edema down if we get things opened. Um, and you know, there's always a chance of failure. So we want to have a lot of discussion going into this and what the expectation should be. And so just in terms of you know, how to address the problem, um, with these kinds of patients, this is just kind of like my view of how I think about access points, because you want to be ready for the challenge. Do you want to go antegrade, retrograde? And really for me, I chose the, the bilateral kind of approach, where really he had bilateral stents, uh, unilateral problem, but I wasn't sure how, we'd, uh, how successful we'd be at getting through this. So I do these under general anesthesia. The patient is heparinized, there's a Foley. We first started off with um, jugular access because I wanted to have that ready and available. Once you go prone, it's kind of hard to get there. And bilateral popliteal access, mostly related to, again, he had bilateral stents. Um, I also use the contralateral side for like IVIS um, or um, venography, putting the wire up, giving me a sense of where I am anatomically. Um, imaging, of course, venography, you want to use rotational venography, you want to use all your views to make sure you're in the right place, make sure you're not in the spine, if there's a lot of collaterals, and IVIS for measuring. So we tried to go integrate from the popliteal, and you can see it's very difficult to get through. There was a lot of hematoma already there, and uh, unfortunately I was not able to get through that large stent in the femoral vein, so then I used my jugular access to first proceed with um, suction thrombectomy, using a uh, T16 and T20 uh, suction catheter all the way down uh, to Profunda. So I wanted to, I said if this was all gonna work, we needed inflow, so we went right into Profunda um, and opened that up. And you can see here on the bottom, that's the image I got based on um, suction thrombectomy and this balloon angioplasty. There's still quite a lot of um, uh, thrombus there and residual changes, because this had been going on probably for about 10 days, if not longer. Usually by the time they present, they've been having symptoms, underlying brewing DVT um, in the background. And after I was able to establish good inflow from Profunda, I switched uh, my catheters from above uh, using a protrieve sheath uh, to capture any embolic debris, because my next move was gonna be RevCor to deal with this instant thrombosis. And just a couple of words about that. Uh, RevCor is a new mechanical device, and so, you don't want to use it in stents that have been in for less than six weeks, and this patient was just at about six weeks. You can use it in native uh, system. You want to understand um, the length, uh, so there's a little bit of limitations with the protrude sheath being 16 centimeters out of the neck and really kind of lose some of the length, so you want to know how far you can go. Down. Certainly here, we weren't uh, going to make it past the stent, and we just got to the bottom of the stent with the device. Um, you want to kind of go in with the device and you want to slowly upsize. You can go anywhere from six millimeters constrained all the way to 20 and using a directional revving type motion. And I think in an ideal scenario, which we didn't have body floss technique here, that definitely helps to establish more uh, stability in the, doing the mechanical thrombectomy. You don't want to use it in fracture stents, stents less than 10 millimeters and anything less than uh, six weeks. So you could see that with that, we were able to establish much better uh, luminal gain of flow with venography here uh, after uh, mechanical thrombectomy and angioplasty. So I thought, and then let me show you some of this, just a sort of a flow with the static images here. 
of what I described. But here's our IVIS images. So after our uh, suction thrombectomy, there was still quite a bit of thrombus left. And as I mentioned, we couldn't get down to the common femoral with the rough core, but we did get uh, into the stent and really an improved uh, clearance of the stent right at that uh, crush point, if you would, or that uh, bend in the pelvis uh, with better flow. You know, the challenge here was you had these 20 millimeter stents, but at the common femoral vein, he was so dilated that actually he was measuring uh, over uh, 20 millimeters or greater, and I was not um, very eager to put another 20 millimeter stent there. Uh, so I thought this was related to the DVT, some dilation behind the DVT, and I wanted things to kind of decompress. Uh, you could see here some of the material we obtained, and this is just a RevCore device with the pro tree sheath. So at this point, I said, well, if this is gonna stay open, then I think I'm willing to put more stents. I decided to stage this case, so I brought him back. Early, two weeks, all uh, my high-risk patients, I try to see at two weeks with a duplex. You could see the CT scan. We have a better um, kind of opening from the balloon angioplasty of the stent that lands in the curvature. His symptoms are improving. His edema is resolving. His Velalto score has decreased from almost 20 to 10. He's on Lovenox doing compression and having good follow-up. So at this point, I think we you know, prevent another problem, in my opinion, just because of the technique of the stent. So I brought him back at the two-month time. Um, continued the Lovenox and um, addressed this through a jugular approach, pricing now an 18 millimeter stent, which still, in my opinion, kind of hurts me, but I also wasn't gonna leave this stent of thrombose. Again, I've never had to put a 20 or an 18 in that uh, sort of area. But you can see here now the flow is much better. At diameters at that time had actually decreased, so that diameter that was 346 millimeters squared went to 218 millimeters squared, so really good decompression after that initial treatment, and he continued to do better clinically. Uh, I did uh, sort of preemptively fix the right side. Um, I mean, I think this patient basically went from a non-therbotic patient to stent disease, and now we're dealing with the stent disease because he really probably didn't need them, but now we certainly don't want to have a DVT on the other side, in my opinion. So this is kind of a, just a judgment call. But you can see that after RevCore, uh, we got, and uh, uh, we were able to clear, that's what we had residually. Uh, the middle picture showed us uh, what we have after Lovenox and the improved flow. So I think at this stage, we, I was ready to revise it with extension to get um, out of the curvature of the pelvis and past the inguinal ligament. Um, and actually what was nice is that when we brought him back, there was a, a lot of that had been resolved really well with the Lovenox, so we had good result and I think a more optimal scenario for uh, additional stenting. So I think in terms of learning points from this, there are many. You wanna have the right, patient, the right therapy for the right patient, so always understand the clinical indication. I think initially this probably wasn't the right patient for this, but then we certainly had a problem we needed to address. Uh, you want to prepare with imaging, access points, you want to have the right devices, know your lengths, where you're coming from. Patient's height matters. I think that, you know, taller patients, sometimes we have challenges uh, getting to where we want. Um, these are long cases, so you want to clear as much thrombus, and my, I try to get as much clearance as possible to set it up for the best uh, scenario to land a new stent. Uh, you want to achieve inflow and good outflow. You want to evaluate for any uh, technical revisions. Do you do it on the same setting, or do you do it delayed fashion? Um, you want to use multiplanar venography and IVIS to get a sense of every, uh, every component of inflow and outflow. Always do one-to-one -one, uh, balloon angioplasty. So that was a 20 millimeter stent. We had to use 20 millimeter balloons. And when you expand the stent post-dilated to its uh, nominal size, that's when you get the most radial force. And you want good stent overlap. Um, we had overlapped it for at least three centimeters, but you want at least two centimeters or greater uh, to get good apposition. And then obviously the post-procedural medical management and edema management are key. Thank you. I'll just start because I, this is an amazing case and um, there's a really a lot to unpack here in this case because um, the first thing is the, this is a very satisfying procedure to do on people and you can really improve their quality of life. But the one thing that comes out to me and you and anyone who does this is a redo venous intervention is one of the most miserable procedures that we do. And it really underscores the need to, on the very first time you're stenting someone, really understand how to do it right. And by the way, we're all learning how to do this. That's why we're here. But um, that's why I'm here. We're all improving. But when you are following someone who has had some misadventures or undersized stents, which tends to be the worst, or very poor inflow, or the other thing you brought out was the importance of that upfront conversation because there's a lot of unknowns in this space 
we're putting stents in people who we expect to stay open for 50, 60 years. Um, that conversation up front about the unknowns and what it means to keep these stents open, the constant surveillance, and we don't really know how far we have to surveil these people. I think it's probably forever. Um, so I think all of those things you highlighted very nicely, so congrats on that case. And, and also, it showed some of the new devices that we finally have to address some of these problems which have been challenging in the past, frankly. Um, the chronic thrombus in a stent is not like an arterial stent. It is very challenging to get a wire through and it's even more challenging to get the debris out, so. And I think, you know, this case, uh, and there's other thrombo stents I've been dealing with, we've had chats about this, and the, the timing is critical. You can't sit on these stents that something is different, they're very different and it happens, it's, uh, you know, even as, as early as six weeks. The collagen buildup just changes the game on trying to clear this. And then what happens is you end up finding yourself in a situation where you may clear some of it, you don't get that really close to the uh, sort of the stent part of that collagen buildup, and uh, you're left with more stenting, but it's not, you know, you're just not gonna get a satisfying result like the first time. So I think, like you said, up front, if you just know up front, you've you got to have the right patient to get a stent. Can, sorry. Can you talk about how you're going to uh, survey this guy long term? Yeah, so, um, well, for life. <laughs> what, what would be your standard regimen? Yeah, yeah so, I, I mean, I usually do, so my two-week evaluation is for that high-risk patient, like a redo patient. Um, otherwise, I'm doing a one month, uh, three months, six, and 12, and then I go annually. Now, um, you know, I think I get a little more comfortable depending on the patient. Oh, duplex, center. just duplex. to be clear. So, thank you. So, duplex. And um, another thing I've started, you know, I look at the waveforms. Well, number one, I look at the clinical patient, like clinically the patient, are they doing well? So, if they're managed, they're feeling good, their legs uh, improved from where I was starting from, I think that's the first sign. Then, duplex, um, looking at the waveforms. I like to look at the what's called the inlet point of the duplex, um, so pre-stent, because then you get more of a spontaneous respirophasic waveform because it's in a native vein. Sometimes in the stent, it may look a little monophasic, and I, sometimes I don't know what to do with it. Is it because the stent and it's rigid, or is it, you know, there's a problem looming underlying, right? And we're, we're along. So that's sometimes a judgment call, and if, you know, so, um, but, and then if they're doing well at one year, I go to annually. I interrupt real fast because unfortunately a lot of these patients that we do IVC reconstructions on, they're obese. I mean, they're really obese, uh, right? And, and your duplex isn't always the easiest exam to get a quality enough image. So then how are you determining this is good enough, we're going to wait another six months and look at it, or when do you make that decision to actually just do a venogram? Well, so in this case, the other thing I had here, I had a CT scan, right? So there were some mechanical, technical things that I, and this, I don't get a CT scan in every patient. Um, but in this case, I felt like I needed to understand exactly how things looked. I mean, I knew I had my on-table image of what looked like an improvement in IVIS too. I could tell on IVIS that the stent had deployed a little better once I did the one-to-one. -one. Um, but, uh, sorry, your question was that, how do you follow obese patients yeah. when ultrasound may not give you the fidelity that you're truly trying to answer the question? I really rely at that groin evaluation of the flow respirophasic and the clinical exam. I don't get routine CT scans, maybe at the one year mark or if there's something unusual that's going on. But clinical it's challenging. Term. I just, Clinic, I clinically, clinical. yeah, I think clinically and that uh, duplex f common femoral waveform or whatever the inflow vessel is. Um, but not routinely with CT. Can so, I ask uh, two quick questions um, to Terry um, in terms of the medical management and the edema management, which was your last bullet? So in these complex, you know, stent thrombosis, what should be the anticoagulation? Obviously, again, very little data to support what should it be, but what, is, what do you guys do at UH? And the second thing is, the patient had phlebolymphedema clearly with ENV elephantiasis nostris. So he should be on some uh, form of compre uh, um, uh, home compression pump or what have you. The second question is, if they are or if you recommend is there a time that the, you say don't do it because of the recent intervention? How long do you pause that? 
the compression, the dynamic compression, not the static compression. So, so I was actually going to ask Karim after his first procedure, what was his antithrombotic or antiplatelet regimen? What did they put him on? Well, I oh the first procedure before he showed up, yeah, um, there was some issues with that. So he was on Eliquis, but for like a month because this was apparently a Neville case, a non-thrombotic lesion. Um, but he did run out of um, Eliquis. But okay. so, so I think um, in these acute settings, I think it's very important, uh, Dr. Clory, that we cool these, off, these folks off first. So I like them on unfractionated heparin in the hospital. I like to cool them off and then low molecular weight heparin when they go home. I'm not sure I feel as confident in using the DOAX initially in these, in these patients. Um, at least a month, um, potentially longer, and I do think you have to look at all of the reasons DOAX may not work in some of these patients, and you have to exclude them before you you move there. Um, so I would be I would be very aggressive in my evaluation of that first. Um, as far as compression, so these guys that are big like this, I think cooling again, compression has a really great anti-inflammatory effect for those lower extremity skin changes. So I think using some form of multi-layer compression initially to cool them off is very important. And I think in an ambulatory patient, using a compression with a high static stiffness index, like a Velcro wrap, um, makes more sense to me, at least initially. And then targeting his BMI and other things, I think is very important. And again, I think pumps and things that they're adjunctive, his maintenance phase has to be aggressive compression. Excellent. Um, sorry, we're running a bit late here. Um, next is Dr. Huff, he's gonna talk about chronic IVC occlusion at case. Yeah, thanks, Raghu. How's everybody doing? You're awfully quiet. Um, yeah, so they've asked me to present a case on chronic IVC occlusion. It's a little bit of a unique case in that most of the time we're dealing with an IVC occlusion uh, below the renal veins, and this was not the case here. So this was a 41-year-old gentleman who was referred to me for lower extremity swelling and abdominal swelling. His cardiovascular history began about 11 years prior when he presented to an outlying facility with abdominal pain. We don't have any records from that, and he's not the best historian, but what he tells us is that he presented with belly pain, they got a CAT scan, there was a DVT somewhere within his abdomen, there was no intervention performed. There was some concern for cirrhosis on that initial presentation, biopsy was negative, it was probably nutmeg liver to be honest, thinking about it. Um, so he ended up being diagnosed on that admission, remember 11 years ago, with C. diff, protein C, protein S deficiency. They put him on warfarin, he's been followed by a Coumadin clinic, his INRs have been mostly therapeutic. Um, and he's done well, he's just been chugging along. Now fast forward to April of this year. He presented to another outlying facility, different outlying facility, with progressive lower extremity swelling and ascites. They did a CT venogram at that hospital which reported non-occlusive chronic thrombus in his iliac veins and distal IVC, intrahepatic IVC occlusion, and then extensive esophageal varices. I got a call from a vascular surgeon who said, I don't know how to handle this problem. Would you mind seeing him in the office? And I said, gladly. The reason I said reportedly demonstrated is because despite multiple efforts and multiple CDs, we could never actually get those images to open. So when he presented to my office, you know, he's a tall, thin male, young, but very uncomfortable, very discouraged with life, marked ascites, marked lower extremity edema, big scrotal swelling, flat neck veins, no heart murmurs. We thought about repeating the CT venogram, but I felt just given his history and the report I already had, we should probably just proceed with venogram and potential intervention. Now, there was a venogram performed by my partner prior to going towards the intervention. I don't show those pictures here, but I just want you to know on that venogram, we just wanted to make sure there was not a problem with the distal IVC or the iliac veins, and they were all fine. But he did have an occluded intrahepatic IVC. So before the intervention, he went and got an EGD by GI and got banding of his esophageal varices. We thought that was important because we knew we were going to have to anticoagulate him and keep him on antiplatelet therapy as well. So the challenge here is this is a guy who's presenting with clinical portal hypertension secondary to an occluded intrahepatic IVC who has big esophageal varices, is suffering, and doesn't have other options. He can't get a TIPS. His IVC is occluded. Um, 
we had to be able to percutaneously revascularize this IVC without damaging the liver, without damaging the right atrium, or without compromising the renal veins. So this is the initial venogram. You can see, obviously, his intrahepatic IVC is occluded. So we started with eight French right common femoral vein access. I used a multipurpose catheter and a straight stiff glide lighter, wire to get through this uh, thrombosis, this chronic occlusion. Now I was very careful not to cross into the right atrium until I knew that I was within true lumen. So that's this picture here. I stopped, took a picture of the catheter, made sure that I was true lumen. At this point, I advanced a stork wire up into the IJ, gave a heparin bolus. The patient was getting um, IV heparin, but I didn't give him a big bolus until after I knew that I had crossed safely. Next step, and perhaps the most important, is intravascular ultrasound to confirm you are where you think you are. We also use it to figure out where the cavoatrial junction is, to figure out where the renal veins are located, to size the stent. All of that stuff is very important. So once I confirmed that I was true lumen, um, I began pre-dilatation. This is a 12 by 4 millimeter and then a 14 by 4 millimeter atlas balloon. You can see the significant waste here. This is post-balloon dilatation venography. You can see we now have flow through there. Obviously, it's still subtotally occluded. You can see the hepatic veins. Then performed repeat IVUS to once again mark the location of the cavoatrial junction, as well as the location of the renal veins. I don't love to, but I was stuck here using a wall stent because the IVC was so big and it was the biggest stent I had. I wanted to make sure we were not gonna get migration into the right atrium, which is a big problem when it happens. So the wall stent was deployed. If you know anything about wall stents, they're, you know, they're closed cell, they're woven. You don't wanna cross the renal veins with them if you can, if you can avoid it. And they're weak on the end. So you can see this is bird beaked up top. I haven't post dilated it yet. So this is after a 16-4 atlas, looks a little better. Obviously, my plan is to post-dilate this a lot more. But before I did that, I wanted to check where we were landing. And unfortunately, despite marking it, um, I ended up shy of the cavoatrial junction. Even though the flow's good, you're gonna have to extend this stent. If you don't, this will close. So it's not fun to extend, but you might as well do it now. So I used a 20 by 60 Abre post-dilated with an 18 by four atlas. So you can see in the first picture, the renal vein flow. We haven't crossed the renal veins. You can see good flow through the stents. You can actually, if you look closely, see the negative contrast wash out from the hepatic veins flowing in. And this is um, a lateral projection to show how this folds into the cavoatrial junction. And this is the intravascular ultrasound post. So we're coming right atrium back towards renal veins. So obviously, the, you know, the Aubrey stent's gonna look a little bit different on intravascular ultrasound than the wall. So you'll see double stent layer here. You'll see that the stenosis is gone. And I just wanted to keep playing to show you the location of the renal veins and what that looks like on intravascular ultrasound if you're not used to looking at it. It's coming. Okay, you can see we've crossed into the wall stent now. It looks very different than the Aubrey stent. And if it keeps coming, you're going to see at like 12 and 6 o'clock, the renal veins. Wait for it. Okay, you see right there, 12 and 6 o'clock. So you know you haven't put a closed cell stent across those veins. So the patient came to my office on 521. This procedure, the revascularization, was performed on 53. It's about 18 days later. He had lost 35 pounds. All of his ascites was gone. All of his lower extremity edema was gone. Duplex on that visit showed patent stents. He subsequently had an EGD um, a few days later, eight days later, 10 days later, um, which showed significant reduction in the size of his esophageal varices. He did not require any further banding. So learning points. Intrapatic IVC occlusion should be suspected in someone who's had prior proximal DVT and they're presenting with ascites. It's not a common presentation for IVC occlusion, to be honest, unless it's involving the intrahepatic area. Axial imaging can help establish the diagnosis. Obviously, it's helpful if you can review the pictures. And intrahepatic IVC can be safely um, reconstructed, intrahepatic IVC occlusion, um, with IVUS guidance and careful planning and a goal of landing the proximal part of the stent at the cavoatrial junction. Thanks. Okay, thank
Thank you so much. Um, just to make sure we uh, stay on the IVC theme and make sure we stay on time, um, why don't we go on to present the filter retrieval case, and then we'll combine the last uh, minutes left for both cases. That was an excellent case. Thank you so much. So we'll move on to Dr. Jolly with difficult IVC filter retrieval. You have five minutes, Jolly. I can do it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, Mehdi was in here. I wish he was in here because I was going to call him. It's going to be you now. Um, I'm going to talk about difficult IVC filter retrieval. Um, I guess there's my disclosures. So uh, th this is a, I, I decided to pick, we've done lots of complex filter retrievals in our program, but I decided to pick what really is a stereotypical IVC filter retrieval um, that we tend to see a lot of, um, a lot of these Gunther Tulip filters that are still on the market, but really were implanted vigorously back in the mid 2000, you know, in that time frame, and they're all starting to percolate back up now. This is a 41-year-old uh, woman with the Shett syndrome, and she had a DVT back in 2006 during a hospitalization. And it's one of those things where a filter was put in and kind of just forgotten about. No one really followed it. I think she forgot she had it. Um, she kind of percolates back in. You know, here we are, you know, decade later, a little bit more, and she has severe post-thrombotic syndrome bilaterally. So um, she comes in. She gets. Always they come in with the ultrasounds. She has chronic DVT. Usually they're not even on anticoagulation. They never were after their index event. And you can, this is a representative sample of her cava. So I just gave you the coronal. So here you see uh, a chronically occluded now infrarenal IVC with uh, just crushing the stent. So it's a Gunther Tulip filter. And you know, this specific kind of filter has its own unique challenges. And I will tell you the challenge with this filter has to do with the minor tines. The minor tines are free. It's just basically one big wire wrapped around this one and they, and they move and they slide. When you do this a lot, you start to recognize that anytime metal is crossing each other, it's a perfect space for fibrous tissue to really lock in. It really locks in on those places. And it makes it challenging to get these out. This particular patient had a 14-year dwell time, but the good news was on the CAT scan, which I didn't show, is that the tip of the filter was centered. So, you know, if you can grab the hook, you, you're halfway there most of the time. And sometimes just grabbing the hook and unroofing it and digging it off with forceps and stuff is half the procedure. So, but before we go there, I wanted to start, and this is a quiet audience, so feel free to speak up if you want. I'll bring the mic to you. But should we even take this filter out of this woman? Why should we take this filter out? It's been occluded for a long time. And if we do or if we don't, should we, should we, uh, how, would we how do we fix this patient's severe post-thrombotic syndrome? Um, so these are the thoughts in my mind. Now, um, when I was making this slide, I decided to, kind of vomit onto the slide, what my normal process is when I try to decide what are the indications for especially complex IVC filter retrieval. I'm not talking about the one that was put in three months ago and now the patient's on anticoagulation. You know, which ones of these filters should we actually go after? Because this isn't the safest procedure we, we do. Um, so the things that I came up with, and I would love anyone else's input. Um, you know, when I'm planning on IVC, when IVC acutely thrombosis, like Karen uh, showed, I, I mean, that, that's a filter that probably needs to come out if it can be taken out with some degree of safety. When patients have fracture or have embolization, they've already demonstrated a certain elevated risk with that filter, I think that's a pretty easy argument to make. There are some filters, some of the old barred these are the ones that come up when you search Google for the lawsuits and the class actions that are very prone to um, perf the fracture and then embolization. I, I tend to get those out, and frankly, they're easy to come out most of the time. Um, occasionally, you have patients that show up and say, I, I want this out because I'm part of a class action lawsuit, and that's not always necessarily an indication to do it. Um, and then we, we definitely have had our share of tines penetrating, and I'm not going to show these cases but they are interesting. We've had penetration into the duodenum. We've had penetration into the aorta. We've had penetration into the spine. So you can penetrate anything and they tend to do it with a relatively high degree of frequency. And sometimes that causes symptoms. I had a lady who had chronic abdominal pain for five years. She had every test known to man, small bowel, follow through, CT scans, MRIs, everything. Um, I think she even had an exploratory laparotomy and they never found anything. It turns out it was just one time in her duodenum. 
And when I pulled that filter out, her pain resolved forever. And it's always stuck in my mind. So you have to think of that. Um, and the bottom, this is kind of representative sampling of the filters, all of which, well, all with the exception of the bird nest on the far right, I have tried taking out. And I think we've been successful in all of these. And Simon Nightingale, I think, skunked us. The Simon Nightingale skunked us, uh, skunked me. Uh, people have taken these out. It's basically a bird nest and an ivy conical filter. The conical filters are the easiest um, in general to take out, especially the ones that have straight tines, like a, like a modern barred filter or a Cook Select as represented here, or ALN, um, the Option Elite. Uh, of course, the Gunther Tulip, which I'm describing here, is challenging. And then you get into the permanent filters like True Greenfields. These can be taken out. They're challenging. These are really good filters, actually. And then the Trapeze Optis. I think these are actually both Optis, so my, my apologies. Um, and then we've had other, other forms of IV interruptions that we've either had to stent or, or take out. Um, but that has to factor in your decision because taking out a Optis filter has a different degree of risk than it does taking out like a standard conical filter that's made to be retrieved. And I think this has to factor in. So for this case, um, our intention was we, we need to restore anatomic venous flow in this patient. This is the reason the patient is um, with severe post-thrombotic syndrome. In general, if we can remove the filter, it does make stenting a little bit easier. It's not an absolute necessity. Um, and the way we typically approach this, especially the Gunther Tulip variety, is with laser because the fibrous formation on these filters is usually dense and significant. Um, and then it kind of depends. These are always done under general anesthesia, but how fast or how slow it goes will often dictate whether we can complete stage two, which is the cable reconstruction now or in a staged fashion. So here is the approach. This is from the IJ, but we start straight away with a large sheath. This happens to be an 18 French cook sheath um, that's 45 centimeters in length so that our 50 centimeter laser can actually extend beyond it. And in this case, it was pretty easy to get the hook, thank goodness, um, but then it started getting challenging as they typically do. Um, and we really like not to straighten the hook because when you're pulling hard enough to straighten the hook, it just makes everything kind of challenging. But um, we were unsuccessful in that endeavor. This is usually where you get to. Um, you get the laser, you start sliding it down, and we we're all the way down to where we have the foot, the feet or the tines or the minor tines. Um, and this is where this case really was pretty challenging. Now, usually we lay on the laser five, six times pulling, pushing, and it tends to just ablate that fibrous tissue and then engulf the filter into the sheath. But it didn't happen here. And it was, um, and so we're pretty far along and we decided to kind of come from below. Now a lot of people will advocate using a balloon technique to try to balloon angioplasty, the tines off the wall. I've never really found it that useful, but I did try it in this case, it didn't work. Um, the other problem in this case is we had to actually find our way up to the inferior vena cava because it was all included in the iliacs, which was pretty easy to do. So here we are, I have a wire through and through. I've tried balloon angioplasty, it's not working. Any ideas? You didn't help with this case, so what would you? That's why it was hard? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. What would you do? So first of all, you see your, uh, your hook is straightening up. You're about losing uh, your snare. So I, I think you're gonna have to grab it with forceps and something else to come down because you're about to lose, your, your, you're gonna make a hook a straight thing. And then I'd prob probably call Chris Huff in now to help you with the case. All right, you're done talking. Okay, so we did straighten the hook, but I straightened that pretty quickly. Um, so we did use forceps, uh, but I actually used forceps from the bottom. And the reason was, if you, if you could look really close, you see all those minor tines, there's a huge ball of thrombus there, and I just can't engulf it, it's too wide. This is kind of what happens with uh, Simon Nightingale's and stuff too. So the idea here is we're gonna grab it and we're gonna lengthen it to make it straighter. And eventually that's kind of what happens. So you can kind of see we're grabbing it, we're lengthening it, I mean, it's just a mess, right? I mean, this is, these cases all look like this, but um, we've managed to finally get in. Now still, it's still tethered. I still can't remove it. You see the last minute jerk there? Well, that has consequences. Um, but usually you're stretching fibrous tissue that's adherent. It's basically the wall of the cava. Um, and so it, that last little boom, that little pull, yeah, that's, you know, don't, we don't like those kind of movements in the cath lab usually. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, it's pretty good, but you know, this is a 5% angio venogram, and then, then you see this. Now, what, what would, am I okay to keep going, or do you want me to wrap this up quick? I know we're, are we good? Yeah, you're good. 
Okay, so I lied to you in five minutes. I didn't do it in five. So we have really disruption of the inferior vena cava. We have a little bit of a perforation. Um, so these can be little, they can be big, they can look worse than they are, or they can actually be worse than they look. That's the problem here. And um, in this particular case, you know, the patient's under general anesthesia, so they're not giving me any biofeedback, with the exception of their blood pressure and their heart rate, which was stable in this patient. So we kind of watched her very closely, but we didn't just watch, we, we decided to try to balloon occlude. This is uh, the beauty of having dissected up from the groin and using a, um, forceps is that we already had the appropriate size sheath to put uh, a coda balloon up, which is a 12 front sheath. So we first took a picture, we didn't have good seal, I brought it down a little bit, nestled it there, still after, you know, a little bit of time, it looked like this. But the patient, um, the patient did bleed into the retroperitoneum, but we didn't cover this particular patient. We have had cases in the past where we actually used aortic cuffs to cover uh, when patients became unstable. Uh, this patient did okay. But we're kind of done with the procedure at this point, um, and we did ultimately bring this patient back um, and reconstructed her cava. And, and uh, I wanted to bring this up and hopefully bring up some points of discussion, maybe even controversy about whether we should be taking these filters out at all. Um, I think it is very necessary in some cases, especially when they tend to thrombose, or the filter itself is giving the patient morbidity. Um, but you do have to have a reasonable ground to stand on and look yourself in the mirror and understand whether you did the right thing. I mean, I think I can honestly say I've taken filters out that were hard and I kind of wondered maybe if I shouldn't have. The patients did okay, but that's part of the growth process here. Um, you have to have all the plans, you have to have the equipment for bailouts, and with that I think we'll stop and take discussions or questions. Can I, ask you a qu I promise I won't ask for Huff. Okay, don't ask for Huff. I'm not asking for Huff, even though he would have made it easier. But anyhow, and all kidding aside, you, you had this occluded uh, IVC in the LX below. Co your comments to the, op uh, to the audience, they, well, I don't think it was completely perforated. So if you put a stent covered graft in now and there's bad inflow, we already heard this earlier, are you putting them at more risk by jumping to the covered stent graft now? How would you, how did you think through that process? Um, I think that's right, and jump in if you want, but it's interesting, you know, the venous space is a low pressure space in the, R, in the RP space. Um, and I've seen operators who have had horrendous perforations who didn't put a stent graft, but just stented it. No, here's why. Let me explain this, and maybe I can convince you, maybe I can't. Now in this case, the inferior vena cava, the, the iliacs are occluded. If you stent the patient and you restore normal flow back to the heart, you're creating a low pressure system and flow is going. It's when it's still occluded and you have inflow that's pressurizing it. So a lot of times if you scaffold it, restore the channel of flow back to the heart, you're gonna quickly equalize your venous pressure with your RP pressure and you're not gonna bleed anymore. So this is kind of the concept between like transcable, you know, you bleed a little bit when you do transcable access. So it's not the end of the world. Like if this was an aorta, I mean, this is a much bigger problem, obviously. But um, in the venous space, you can get away without stent grafting. I agree with you. I have a little bit of trepidation putting covered stent grafts in the veins because they're low flow and, and all the attendant risks with that. So, um, Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> that's an excellent point because one of the questions I was going to have for you related to that um, is uh, I noticed that in the beginning you put you went ahead for the filter right so mm -hmm. um, and then I saw right groin access so when do you first try to get a wire through so to me again you got to prepare for this potential rupture right then how do you mm -hmm. kind of set yourself up for that success so you can keep the patient stable so do you always kind of not have a wire through first at the time of filter retrieval? Do you try to have a wire through first just in case for that rupture? I, I wouldn't say I always do, but as it's becoming obviously more challenging and you know you're, you're running up against that margin of mm -hmm. risk, yeah. that's when it becomes more important either to have a wire through, but you can obviously put the balloon from your retrieval sheath as well. I mean, you can give up your system and put a balloon down. So you still have access and you still have the ability to tampon on. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, all that is in play. Yeah. Oh, there's a question back there from the audience. I do agree though with you though with the um, low pressure system uh, comment and if a patient's stable you could put a, a regular venous, you know, appropriately sized stent or a, a other uh, stents uh, just to kind of get you to that low pressure state and stop uh, bleeding. Thank you. A great case. Uh, how often do you use general anesthesia? I have used for such in, in the past myself a few times. And I really rely big time on the patient feedback when, because with the forceps especially, it's hard to 
know what you're grabbing. So when patients say I'm in pain, I'm kind of back off. So I really rely on this big time, especially when I use forceps. Yeah. Um, excellent question. I, I'm a cardiologist. Um, I hate anesthesia. Uh, not because the anesthesiologists, sometimes, but, um, but I'm so used to having that feedback. I, 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 exactly what you say. When you're picking, 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 patients like, ah, you probably shouldn't pick there. When they're under anesthesia, there's no feedback. So you're just picking away. You, you may be just picking a hole straight through the cava. So um, yes, I totally agree with you. But these patients, especially the chronic ones like this, this hurts. It hurts even when you're doing it perfectly. So I think on this case, you have to have anesthesia. These patients will come off the table. If it's a little less, you know, the dual times, six months, and it's a little hooded, yeah, we can often get away doing those, even with forceps without, but something that's totally occluded, super locked on, where you're literally pulling it out like this, it takes anesthesia. Hey, can I ask a question? Both great IVC cases, uh, Chris. Um, in, your situ in your patient situation, um, the etiology we think is probably congenital. That's number one. Number two is um, your stents were pretty close to the diaphragm. Um, how are you going to, f what is your surveillance plan for this uh, patient and what is the anticoagulation plan for this patient? Yeah, so when you think of IVC occlusion, especially intrahepatic IVC occlusion, it's either usually from a line that was placed, we've seen that, someone places a central line or a port or something that extends through the right atrium into the IVC, we had a recent case, or there's some sort of inherent congenital problem with the IVC, uh, prior umbilical vein um, cannulation is a, is a premature, uh, right, as a newbie, that happens, we know it happens. Um, so this patient probably had an underlying congenital problem with their IVC. When they presented 11 years ago, it probably closed all of the way, I'm guessing, and then they, um, at first, the patient compensated through collaterals and then reached a point where they couldn't compensate anymore, probably when the uh, portal system became overwhelmed. Um, but yeah, probably underlying congenital problem. In terms of anticoagulation, actually, in terms of surveillance, um, I just duplex. If the flow is normal and duplex as far as I can see, then I won't, and clinically the patient's fine, then I won't CT scan the patient. But if there's any abnormal flow, it looks different compared to prior. Any change in frequency of the surveillance is what I was trying to say. Oh, yeah. No, I think for me it's one month, three months, six months a year still. That's okay. Um, and then anticoagulation, the patient has protein C, protein S deficiency, has thrombosed before, probably because of a congenital problem. As long as he's tolerating it and the esophageal varices look like they have resolved or are resolving, I'll probably keep him on long-term anticoagulation. Meaning with warfarin, no, with warfarin. no brief period of um, inoxaparin for a month or six weeks, anything mm, like that. Yeah, okay. I just warfarin. You switched him back, bridged him back. I did, I bridged back. him back. Okay. Yep. And I did, okay. I did clopidogrel for two months. Okay. Uh, Chris, just real quick, I know um, we're kind of running out of time, but my question is, um, so great case, and I'm wondering your thoughts on um, other stent options around that retrohepatic area, um, like the Z stent, um, and how do you view uh, your ch stent choice um, in light, I mean, you talked about making sure the renal veins stay open, what about the hepatic veins? Um, you know, there are some case reports of patients going into acute bud Chiari syndrome if you occlude the hepatic, so uh, just some thoughts on that. Um, so this was actually a big debate at the time of my intervention. I, I thought really hard about placing a Z-stent, but in the end, I was just concerned about the length of them and the risk of poor deployment leading to embolization, watermelon seeding, things like that. I didn't feel like I had good control over it. Um, I would love to have used an Abre if I could have. It's open cell. It's less likely to be a problem, but it just wasn't a good option because I needed apposition. I think the worst thing that can happen in that situation is migration into the right atrium and significant migration to the right atrium. But, you know, I don't know, retrospectively, you know, could I have used a Z-stent? Maybe. But again, I was worried about control. As you know, deploying Z-stents, it's not, you don't have great control. Um, and that's a place where you need to have good control. They don't have great strength either. I mean, you know, a Z-stent. Super open cell for sure, but not a lot of strength um, to stay open. Yeah, no, yeah, obviously the, the patient did great, you know, lost 35 hours. But I think you're worried about long term. I mean, yeah, if, if, the, if 
the closed cell design could cause thrombosis of the hepatic veins like we see when we would jail the right common iliac vein for a May Yeah, and so we have to watch. Thank you, awesome. Well, excellent session to everyone. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience. And with that, we'll let you take your little break and move on. Thank you.